And now I'll get to our uh, speakers for the night. We have a really exciting panel, uh, kind of three-headed monster, if you will. <laughs> uh, we're excited to have Natalie Schaefer here from Yakona, also our education uh, board representative on, on the Midcoast board. Uh, she's going to give us a little bit of background, history, uh, mission, all that kind of stuff about the Yakona Nature Preserve. Really cool effort uh, and learning center uh, going on out there. Just this is open. I can almost point to it right over there. Um, so thank you, Natalie. Uh, we'll start with that. We also have Siobhan Sargent here. Uh, thank you for coming uh, from Silva Santerra, um, talking about how forest management plans and, and working that through that with private landowners. Um, plugging them into, you know, uh, federal state funding opportunities and kind of being the glue to get a lot of these projects planned and funded and on the ground with, with private landowners. And then our, our longtime partner, Annie Marion here from Natural Resources Conservation Service, uh, talking about some of the financial uh, opportunities to landowners to do this type of work, cost sharing. Uh, Annie brought a whole bunch of flyers back there in the background. I think it's a good good timing because most of the signups for a lot of that stuff are into November. So um, spreading the word on that, get that out to landowners. Annie's also going to be joining us at the end of October up in Alsea, uh, reaching out to some landowners up in that basin to get more folks signed up for these incentive programs and get more of these forest management plans uh, developed and implemented. So um, looking at staff, if I'm forgetting anything, looking good. So. Please uh, join me in welcoming Natalie to get started. Good evening, everyone, and thank you for coming to learn about the Yakona case study, how we've worked together with Silva Santerra and RCS to do this amazing work that we're doing at Yakona. I also wanted to say hello to someone I saw sign on, Vicki Bach, a friend of mine. So hi, Vicki. She can hear you. <laughs> the, the arrow is not working. Oh. And we're missing our Natalie. Our Natalie. That's either. about the technology issues. And thanks to Carrie for stepping up. And Cheryl. It's all been Cheryl. And Cheryl. Sorry. <laughs> right. So, where is Yakona? Yakona is uh, just across Yakona River from Newport and uh, sort of around the Hatfield LNG plant sort of area. We're a nice large peninsula of about 400 acres. We were founded by Bill and Joanne Barton and um, they're amazing. Here they are in the room. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And we are a mixed forest ecosystem dominated by Sitka spruce, but also Douglas fir and Western hemlock, as well as Western red cedar, and all the other species that you might expect growing on the coast. So uh, we have all the animals you might expect in a natural area that are resident populations, elk, black bear, and nesting bald eagles. That's one of the reasons why the whole property wasn't cut is because we have a pair of nesting bald eagles. So our habitats range from mature forests to forest plantations to wetlands. We actually have several wetland areas and Sitka spruce tidal swamp, which for those of you that are here and I know most of you know just how important Sitka spruce tidal swamp is. Now, it's the original homeland of the Yakong people who are now members of the Confederated Tribes of Siletz Indians. And we tell a pretty amazing history. What's really cool about Yakona is that so much about what happened in this state can be told right from the peninsula, starting with the indigenous people, moving through the European settlement. And uh, what we're looking at here is the peninsula across the water. There's a school and a couple mansions. So this was West Jaquina also part of the story. And in the foreground, that's Yaquina City. And then during World War I, the Toledo Mill was built, excuse me. And with that, we had, of course, the, the soldiers that were the soldier logger brigade, the only time that a trade has been conscripted in our history. But what do we do today? We serve, uh, Audiences of all ages from preschool now all the way up into post-secondary education. 
And what we like to do is center students as scientists. They're engaged in the exact same monitoring protocols that we are. They're measuring temperature. They're watching succession happen in real time. We have the younger students and then we have the high school students like this young woman who was one of our STEM hub interns last year. And what she's doing here is phenology using nature's notebook and watching the changes in the seasons. Here she's measuring our dendrometers. We have five of them down in O'Grady. That actually measures, it's so cool, the expansion and contraction of the tree throughout the day, how it transpires and loses water and then gains water. It's, it's really very cool. And then water quality monitoring. Everything that we do for monitoring is based in climate science. We're interested in understanding how a warming climate is changing the forest. And so we now have about two and a half years worth of data. We measure every Monday without fail, even on a holiday, because we have some good docents that can help to fill in when we're gone. But we're measuring these things and then we have students learn about them while they're out in Yukona. We, besides the education program, of course, we're very focused on habitat and habitat restoration. Because so many people have owned the property over the many years that we've had human habitation in this area, I like to call it a forest mosaic. There's um, recent stands that were planted about 11 years ago that had been clear cut. There are stands of plantation forests that are 40 years old, 60 years old. And then we have very beautiful, mature forest that could maybe even be as old as 140 years, the last time it was cut during World War I. And then here we have people down in the slough. So you'll hear a little bit more from Siobhan on the Forest Master Plan and Annie on NRCS. But what I wanted to point to is what we're doing based on the Forest Master Plan and based on the work that we're doing with NRCS is we are rehabilitating many places in Yakona. And so what we're doing in the slough is introducing riparian vegetation. It's probably there at one time, long before there was human habitation. In this slough, West Yaquina was plotted all the way across it. So we can guess, don't know for sure, but we can guess that there were grazing animals. Of course, we know there still are. Their name is elk. <laughs> and they do graze on everything that we plant. So we have to, of course, uh, uh, contain them. But what we've done is installed riparian vegetation. So hooker's willow and red alder and crab apple. And we've tried some other species that uh, we planted with stakes instead of with plugs. So the difference between that, of course, is a stake is just a stick where a plug always has roots with dirt around it. And what we have learned in Yakona over the last year, stakes don't work. You've got to use plugs. So plugs are working just fine. So what we've done now is gone through and caged all of the plugs because those are the only ones that lived. And we are now monitoring them as part of our contract with NRCS. So we have what I call an upper metal, meadow and a lower meadow that you'll uh, learn more about. But we also have this project. Um, NRCS contracts us with something to do every year. And so what we thought we'd do, the SLU is this year, but we're also kind of getting a head start on what we know is coming to kind of give us a feel for what it is that we'll be working into. So this is what we call a cultural planning. We've planted 20 hazel, which are of course an important cultural plant for basketry. And we have, of all of them that we planted, there were 20 and 19 are living. And the one got chomped on by an elk before we put cages around it. <laughs> and then the other major thing that we're doing under the CSP, Conservation Stewardship Program Grant, is building these habitat piles. And while we're going to be doing them actually through EQIP rather than CSP, but 
what we'll be doing with all the thinning that we need to do that Siobhan will tell you a little bit more about is keeping the carbon on the ground. So we're building habitat piles. Instead of just leaving slash, we're building habitat piles, which provide small animals a place to, to a shelter. So that's pretty much the extent of my presentation. I just want to acknowledge our professional photographers, Bill, Roger, and Rena. If it was a funky looking photo, it was mine. Otherwise it's kind of theirs. And then this one, of course, is one of theirs. So with that, Harry, I'll turn it over to Siobhan next. Hi, everyone. Thanks for being here. Thanks for the invitation. It's really great to be with you all and share about this great collaboration that I am privileged to be part of uh, over at Yakona. My name is Siobhan Sargent, and I am the founder and principal of Silva Terra LLC. I'm based out of Albany, Oregon. I'm a professional forester um, consultant. And uh, this picture here is the first time I was at Yakona. That's me and Joanne with Grandmother Tree. And uh, this was the start of this collaboration in uh, May 2022. So as a, as a consultant, I assist landowners and organizations with achieving their objectives. So landowners and organizations, and we've got we've got both going on there in Yukona as a landowner and an organization. Um, so my work is very heavy to this collaboration, which is the theme of tonight. Um, so so what's how do I fit in the picture here? Uh, as a consultant, I, I have gone through the process to become a technical service provider with the NRCS. And the primary goal there, the purpose of the technical service provider is to provide um, a delivery of the technical service that's aligned with and it's, and it's an, an extension of the mission of NRCS. And as a, so that that's, that's almost almost exactly what how you would define TSP, but a broader as a forester, I see my goal, my uh, my role as we're gonna move broad vision and direction for a property into beneficial conservation activity. So we're gonna put put vision into action on the ground. And then even more personally for me as a consultant, I see myself as an interpreter of this process, which is not always easy and straightforward. It's a little little bit of you know paperwork and government bureaucracy, and we have to like navigate that process. It can be confusing at times. So I know the process well, and I partner with Annie to help people understand how how this is all going to happen. Like, what's what's the process? How are we going to get there? And then above all, as a consultant, I'm an advocate for the landowner for the organization. I'm there to help you achieve your objectives. And I, I hold that, that's that's very important to me and, and the center of my role. Okay, so what is this process? Um, this, is, this is my graphic. This is how I envision it happening. So the forest management plan is to me, it brings two things together. It's your values, which are expressed as goals for your forest land. And then we combine that with the existing forest conditions to come together, put those two things together into, okay, I have a broad vision for what's gonna happen. And then I know what's happening on the ground. How do I bring those two things together to then move into action? So as a, as a process or a hierarchy, the goal is the overall vision. And then we come down and we say, okay, we have the vision, the goals. What are the actions that we can take to achieve that goal? Those are your objectives. And then we put that into a timeline that becomes your 10 year plan. And then we come down and we say, okay, we've given it, we've given it a timeline, but what specifically are we going to do? Which trees are we going to cut and leave? What, what's our prescription? And that becomes the design and implementation. And these numbers here that you see, the 106, those correspond with the NRCS uh, program numbers. So 106 is a, is a forest 
uh, management plan, and then 165 is your design and implementation. So those become the, the projects, which are a bundle of practices. So, so once you have those bundle of practices, and you, you that's when you would be applying for the equip. And we've done that at Yakona. It's applied for, we've been approved. So now we've moved into the operational plan. So we're actually going to go do these activities. Natalie's already outlined some of the activities that are going on, planting hazel, uh, enriching the slough with various species, building these habitat piles. So those then become, they each have their own operational plan and activities that are going on on the ground. So we're right in the middle of, of this part of the process. We did the, the planning, I think Annie has a, a timeline, so you'll see our timeline, but you know, starting that May 2022 to now, we've kind of gone through all those steps with the plan having been complete March of last year, 2023. <clears throat> so how did all this process play out at Yakona? So these are taken from the forest master plan, which I'm circulating there. If you want to see what one physically looks like, often people say, well, what is this thing that I'm, what am I doing with you, Siobhan? <laughs> it's very rare that I get to share an actual product. So if you want to take a look at that, if you're in the room, you want to take a look at that physical copy. Um, so, so we have the vision and mission of Yakona, which Natalie's already discussed a bit, and we took that and distilled it into a unifying forest management goal, which is Restore native spruce-dominated coastal rainforest with a focus on habitat enhancement, ecosystem adaptation and resilience, providing a living laboratory for public engagement and education in perpetuity. So there we go. There's our big umbrella vision and goal. So what do we do? Like what's what's next? Um, so as, as a process for figuring out what's going on on the ground. So we've got our goal, now we need to figure out what's on the ground. We're looking at things like, what are the soils? What are the water systems like? Uh, what's the topography? What are different forest ages and types? What's the structure of the forest? What's the existing infrastructure that we're dealing with? Roads and trails. So we're collecting all of this information and, and it all ends up in the master plan that's getting passed around. Um, you can see here, Natalie is doing an increment core sample, which you can see at the bottom there is extracted from the tree to count the age, uh, the rings. So you can tell the age of the tree. And with... honestly, she had to come and help me. <laughs> No way I was able to twist that thing a bit at time. <laughs> yes, yes. I do like to prove my strength in the woods. Here. <laughs> I've got I've got a process, right? Um, yeah, so we hiked around the woods, uh, really fun. There were already uh, there was already an inventory, but there, there were actual sample plot samples taken to kind of measure tree diameters and height and species. So that had already been done as part of some of the land transfer process and so we had that, and then I, I'm bringing together, you know, other, other maps and things. So, so we get, so we get to the point where we can start putting this into a map. And I love a visual. To me, the stand map, which is on the right there, that becomes like that's that's the visual document that that almost describes all the writing that's in the plan. So. You can see the red boundaries on the left is a is a hill, what's called a hill shade, and that's showing you kind of a three-dimensional view of the land if there were no trees on it from above. And so you can see the, the topography in places are quite steep and lots of lots of channels coming down. And the red is those are actually the tax lots. So you can see all the little boxy ones there. That's West Equina, which was plotted way back. So there's still all of these still in the tax lot, there's, what is it? It's it's like 45 parcels at this point mm -hmm. of tax lots because of all those little little buggers in there. <laughs> and and so so that so that's one important on the right. We now have that's an aerial photo. So you're looking down from above. And you can kind of see uh, underneath the colors there that there are definitely different textures to the land and that's on the ground, you can tell, like, say, the valley in the middle, that's the most recent clear cut. And 
then write down the one that's called Starker, which was, of course, a former Starker parcel, uh, that that is has more texture to it. That's an older forest type. So we've got, like Natalie said, the mosaic here. We've got a lot of different forest types. We put it into nine stands. Stands are just, it's just a, a, a way for us to kind of get our heads around. What are we going to do where? It usually is somewhat uniform in its age and its structure and the species that are in this, this area. So we can put some lines around and say, okay, we're going to treat this as, as a unit. Okay, so, so we're starting to get a, an idea of what's going on on the property. Uh, and I am starting in my own mind to have these initial ideas about, okay, how are we going to translate the big goal, the vision, into action on the ground? And so this becomes then a process of conversation. I think we had a lot of conversations, phone conversations in the woods conversations, just, just trying to bring, okay, so this is what I'm seeing. This, these are the types here. Now we have the stands named and we have them mapped. You know, how do we bring that down into action? Um, so in this part of the process, I usually am meeting with the landowner on the ground. I always loop in NRCS and we have at least one. I think we had at least three. This is a bigger project and, and a larger property. But just to figure out how we're going to align the activities with NRCS's equip programs so that we, we optimize you know, the potential for cost share there and, and package them appropriately into a set of activity bundle. So yeah, these are just some nice wood finds, lots of lots of fun time walking through the woods. And that's my little with my little Ida with Joanne there by the slew. Okay, so so now we're able to move into our objectives, right? We know what's on the ground, we have our broad vision, we're putting the two together into these things called uh, goals in action, which are objectives. And these are not all of the objectives, but I've highlighted the ones that are relevant to the activities that we're doing with EQUIP and through EQUIP. So much of uh, Yakona is going to be managed to accelerate old growth characteristics uh, of the native forest type. So that's, that's a central objective for most of the forest. As part of that, we're trying to nurture and enrich native plant diversity while minimizing the invasive species that we have that are trying to ooh, take over. <laughs> um, the ivy and the blackberry, which most are familiar with, are good friends. Um, but knowing that old growth does not provide the different ha habitat types, and we ha already have this mosaic, which the native wildlife is using quite effectively, you know, grazing in the open, sheltering in the closed, uh, we, over time, have the intent to maintain these pocket meadow ha habitats and this early successional habitat on the, throughout the forest in specific locations, so that we don't over time, as things grow into old growth, that we're not missing that piece, that important piece on the landscape. And then finally, uh, this conducting uh, non-commercial thinning in these two stands, that's uh, that's the one of the immediate overarching, it's, like, it's the thinning that holds the bundle of equip practices together, so. Um, Without going too deep into it, it's you know you have to hang your your various bundle of practices on a primary practice, and then the others become facilitating practices, right? <laughs> so, <laughs> I'm learning. <laughs> we all are learning. Okay, so so what does this look like then? Okay, so we take the sand map, which you know that's just our different forest types, and then visually, this is. This is roughly what's, this is what we've applied for, for EQIP and have been uh, awarded cost share for to conduct. So what you're looking at there, again, is that LIDAR hillshade with the red tax lots. And then the stands are, are in there too. And the two colored ones, the pink and the yellow, those are our thinning. And those are, those are older pre-commercial thinning. They're, it, we're calling non-commercial thinning because you think pre-commercial thinning is like in little stuff. These are almost 40 year old, but they are they are overstocked, they're too dense. 
And as part of bringing bringing that those old growth characteristics, one of the practices to achieve that is to kind of speed up the process of the, you know, the natural process, which would be that, you know, individual trees will compete and die. But we're also providing a little bit more uh, safety from a fire risk perspective, or we're giving it, we're bringing that stuff to the ground instead of leaving it all to stand, right? Because these, these, these stands were established as plantations, right? So they weren't started with the intent that they would go all the way, you know, long term, right? There was a, there was a probably a 40 to 60 or probably 60 max that they were going to go and then be cut. So we're doing these intervening practices to accelerate that old growth condition, this sort of patchy, clumpy, mixed species variety of uh, canopy structure. So the thinning is just the first step in that. And as part of that, what, we're ta what, what Natalie showed is that we're taking that material and then we're going to enhance some of the, the habitat characteristics by kind of making these surrogate logs where they're meant to stand in for the duffy logs that might have been pulled off the landscape in the past. So we're we're starting to try to add some of those characteristics, large, large woody debris down on the ground, and then these kind of den-like areas where creatures can hide. So uh, the, those are the piles and then the large log surrogates that will be using the material from the thinning to, to create. Uh, and then the crosshatch is, is that, you know, we've got these invasive species, they're pretty well distributed across the landscape. And so we've taken a percentage of those will get treated. Um, and that's both the chemical and mechanical treatments to address that. And those are, those are already underway. We're like, we're, for these practices, we were approved earlier this summer and I, the first official thing is going to be happening in like two weeks. So we are right in the, in the midst of getting this going on the ground. And even today I was out looking at how we're going to implement the thinning in, uh, in a short period of time too. So with that, I think I have gotten to where we are and uh, thank you. Unfortunately, it's not allowing us to do that. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> I just use air to stop and there's some yeah. Mm -hmm. yep. I need to be down here. Oh, okay. All right. Hello. Um, so I'm Annie Marion. I work for NRCS. Um, we are a federal agency, part of the U.S. Department of Agriculture. Uh, the Natural Resources Conservation Service has been around since the 1930s. We were originally the Soil Conservation Service, and then our mission has expanded. Um, and so today I'm going to just talk about forestry kind of focus practices, but we work with um, agricultural producers, and uh, private forest owners, non-industrial private forest owners um, to implement conservation projects on their land. Oops. Oh. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so, if we're working with uh, a forest um, owner or manager, the first thing that we ask is um, to have a forest management plan. That's really our starting point, really for everything that we do with NRCS. You gotta have a plan before you start jumping and trying to do something on the ground. Um, this outline, outlines the landowner's vision for their forest. So it's really looking not only at maybe timber production, but, um, are they interested in non, non timber forest products, fire resilience, um, woodland resilience to pests, disease, drought? Uh, maybe they want to create wildlife habitat or enhance the habitat they already have. 
um, or they're just you know interested more in sustainability, legacy, handing the the land on to their their family members or other folks, um, recreational uses, education like Yakona. There's a whole lot of different reasons that people are managing their their forests, and so um, we definitely want to start with that. And then, um, as Siobhan was talking about, we um, go out and make sure that we understand what's there. Uh, you know, stand descriptions, um, you know, what, what trees you have, what species, what's the stocking rates, what's the current health of those trees, and then other things like infrastructure, roads, water sources, wetlands, anything like that, recreation sites, wildlife habitat, just getting a good description of what's there. And then the plan really should outline that plan of action. So how are you gonna achieve your goals? And it really lays it out in a, in a timeline, prioritizing, where do we start? You know, where can we go from there? So um, there's a lot of different ways to develop a plan like this. If folks have experience working um, in the forest, they might be able to just develop this themselves. There are templates available from <clears throat> um, OSU Extension and, and other folks. Um, you can also work with OSU Extension or the um, there's Oregon Small Woodlands Association that um, provides a lot of information. They do meetings a couple times a year. Um, and then there's also the ODF, um, newly created Small Forest Land Owner Office. Um, so in the past, we just had stewardship foresters. Now we've got these small woodland owner um, foresters that are meant to be working directly with um, non-industrial small woodland owners on their, their projects, their, their properties. Um, so what we do is we have um, cost share funding. Um, Siobhan mentioned this, um, available from our Environmental Quality Incentives Program. That's EQIP for short. The government, we love our acronyms. There's a lot of them. <laughs> um, and the the amount that we pay is kind of roughly based on acreage. So there's, it goes to everything from maybe a thousand dollars for a pretty small, less than 10 acre property up to, you know, maybe seven or eight thousand dollars for a real large plan. Um, and, and the way we do that is working with technical service providers like Siobhan. So these are professional foresters that have gone through a certification process with NRCS so that we know they understand what we're looking for and they're able to write a plan and write prescriptions that are gonna kind of meet our requirements. So this cost share funding comes from Congress. We get a farm bill every five-ish years, we're a little overdue now. Um, and that comes down through a number of programs, but our two main programs that we work with mostly are the Environmental Quality Incentives Program and this Conservation Stewardship Program. And these are programs that are meant to incentivize private landowners to do conservation projects that in some cases might improve their bottom line either in the short term or the long term, but a lot of times it's providing a larger ecosystem service that's beneficial to all of us. You know, they're doing something that's going to improve water quality. They're doing something to provide wildlife habitat. You know, all of these things that are a larger scale and harder for somebody to tackle on their own small scale without a little bit of both technical assistance and the financial assistance. So um, EQIP is really focused on usually shorter contracts of um, implementing on the ground conservation to address identified resource concerns. So if we say, you know, it looks like you've got an erosion problem there. What can we do to help you fix that? Can we plant a cover crop? Can we, you know, do something to improve your soil health or your, um, your forest management to address that? Uh, the conservation stewardship program is a little bit different. It's often for folks who have already been doing some level of conservation on their property and are kind of looking to take it maybe to the next level. So it's a five-year contract um, where there's an annual payment that's just based on, you know, we do a whole assessment of the property and we say, okay, you've done this and this and this and this already. We're going to give you this annual payment that's based on your current level of conservation. That's just 
payment every year to keep on maintaining that. And then on top of that, we're going to give you additional payments for enhancements that you choose to do. So say, well, we already have some wildlife habitat, but we want to enhance it. We want to make it better for bats, for beavers, whatever it is. We're going to do these activities on this acreage. We'll give you an additional payment the year that you complete that practice. So that's kind of the difference between those two programs. So this is just a little um, timeline to give you an idea of what the process was like for us working with the Acoma. It's, it's a lot of paperwork and it's a long process. Nothing happens real quickly. You know, you're not gonna see something happen overnight. So we started back um, in 2021. We had our first conversations with the Acoma, um, submitted the application, had to get all of the land registered with the farm service agency who kind of handles all the farm records. You know, there's definitely some hoops to jump through, but um, we were able to get them enrolled in the EQIP program by that spring. And then they had a year to complete their forest management plan. And so that's where they um, they reached out to, you know, looked at their, the list of technical service providers, found Siobhan, started that relationship and started working with her on developing their plan. Um, and, and just timing wise, it ended up that they were able to complete that plan the following March and, um, they were, you know, they were ready to start implementing it. They said, let's go. So our next equip sign up wasn't going to be till the fall again. So we, we did look at, you know, what, what parts of the plan would it make sense to put into an equip application, an equip contract? Um, and there, you know, things like the thinning, um, were a good fit for that and some of the um, invasive weed control. Um, but there were other activities that they wanted to do that was kind of more of the wildlife enhancements and stuff that really made sense for CSP. And so there's no hard and fast rule that you can, you know you have to do equip before CSP or you can't do both together. And so they ended up applying um, in March. We had their, our sign up for the CSP program and were able to get them enrolled that summer so that they started on some of those habitat enhancement projects at the same time that they were then applying for EQIP in the fall. And then now we just got that, that contract finalized and they'll be able to start implementing those the thinning and some of that slash treatment and other activities. So this is, you know, every case is gonna be different, but this is the way that it really worked out um, for Yukona. And so then you get to implementing the plan. So the conservation stewardship um, contract, like I said, has some some activities. Um, so the first thing we did actually was uh, develop a wildlife habitat management plan for upland landscapes. So this was kind of a synthesis of all of the information from the forest management plan that Siobhan had developed and, and Yukona's goals. You know, they said, we really want to um, provide more pollinator habitat. This That's something that we've already been working on and we want to keep on expanding our pollinator meadows in these, these little clearing areas, kind of a rocky top area where you're not really going to have much forest anyway and some, some openings in the forest. Um, we want to see about, you know, how we can bring beaver back to some of these streams and what's missing, what can we do to address that? We can plant some some beaver food, right? Some willows, some, some other native shrubs. Um, along Yocona Slough, so there was an enhancement that fit that. Um, and then we looked at snag creation. So they, you know, we kind of worked with our forester and with Siobhan on figuring out like, how many snags do we have in these stands already? Is that sufficient? Is that providing enough habitat for bats and other kind of snag dependent wildlife? And we found that, you know, maybe there's one stand where it made sense that there's not going to be a lot of other activities. There's not a lot of recreation use in there, but they can actually go in and strategically decide, okay, we have some standing live trees that we could turn into some good snacks, either through girdling or topping, something like that, to create that habitat that's going to be there for, you know, many years until you get more natural snack creation as these um, stands mature. Um, and then Natalie already mentioned the cultural plantings, so they've got the hazel going in in some places. And then one other thing that they were looking at was on-site carbon storage. That's, um, you know, with a lot of the new funding that we have available to 
the Inflation Reduction Act. A lot of that is coming down into our farm bill programs through EQIP and CSP. Um, and it's all about either reducing emissions of greenhouse gases or increasing carbon stocks. How do you increase carbon stocks? You either capture it in living trees, vegetation, or in the soils. So activities that um, that enhance that are, are being incentivized. And in this case, it's just kind of, it wasn't really too much of a lift, I think, but it was going through the forest management plan and saying, okay, how can we identify areas that are going to be set aside that are not going to be, you know, that these are going to be stands that are left in perpetuity. Um, what, what can we do with our management to increase soil, soil carbon, you know, whether that's eliminating brush pile burning or minimizing it, trying to get more of that lop and scatter or those habitat piles, anything that keeps more of that carbon on site that's really like building up and working for them. And then the EQIP um, contract, um, we already kind of mentioned this, it's the invasive species um, control, some of the, yeah, the maybe holly, blackberries, scotch broom, kind of your, your typical um, uh, contenders that we see here that might be um, inhibiting growth, of it, particularly in some of the younger stands where there's a lot more sunlight. Um, we've got some uh, thinning planned and the slash treatment. And then like we were talking about these, um, you know, brush pile structures. This one's kind of a, looks like a little log cabin. There's a lot of different <laughs> methods for building these piles, but there is wildlife habitat piles using that slash that you're created that's kind of like a waste product um, and, and putting it into something useful. Um, and then the pollinator meadows. So they're gonna be doing some plantings on several different locations for, for the pollinator habitat. And that's really all I've got. And like Evan said, I brought a bunch of flyers if anybody is interested in anything. Um, and my contact information is on, on those. So you're welcome to follow up with me. Thanks. We have a little time for questions if there's any. Um, Pop back up there. There's any? There's not. Enough, but I have a question. Question for Annie. Mm -hmm. Um, and this is broader than what you talked about here. But under the farm bill, it's as you said, it's overdue and is in. I would assume they're getting closer because I've been hearing about it for a while. Mm -hmm. Is it is is the farm bill made substantial pivoting towards uh, changes that needed to be made? In other words, it used to be driven by huge corporate farms and their lobbyists and their giant staffs. Is, has there been a pivot towards uh, more work like this, conservation, or in support of the federal 3030 program, uh, natural climate solutions? Is, is there some of that, more of that in there in small? Ag and small forests and more incentives for all of those things that didn't used to see the light of day. Yeah. yeah. If you could just try to repeat the question. So yeah. So the question was about the farm bill and how that's developed and what's going into it. Um, I'm definitely not an expert <laughs> on that process. There is a lot of lobbying and a lot of a lot of different interest groups. So there's definitely still going to be a lot of the, the large ag in there, but I think there's a lot of lobbying from more conservation groups too that have, I think, been moving the needle in um, allowing more of that money to go to different types of conservation. Um, you know, as seen through the, the Inflation Reduction Act, we it's really a historic amount of money that our agency is getting over the course of four years, I think, four or five years, something like that. Um, so we're still kind of in the ramping up stage of that. And it's like, I mean, it's doubled the size of our budget for EQIP and CSP just last year and this year, and it might even be more next year. Um, so that's pretty huge. Um, and there's definitely, there have been more initiatives um, that really are trying to address um, small farms, beginning farmers, 
what we call historically underserved producers. And so that can cover a lot of categories, but it also includes urban ag, trying to, you know, they recently stood up kind of urban conservation centers across the country and have partnered with local agencies to um, start implementing that and doing outreach and trying to increase participation of smaller and maybe non-traditional ag in accessing our assistance, technical assistance, financial assistance, all of that. Um, and there's a lot of money also going to um, our easement program, which I didn't really talk about, but there's agricultural land easements and um, wetland reserve easements and um, healthy forest reserve program. So there's different types of easement programs that's not as production focused, more conservation focused, um, trying to increase that. Very good. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, this question is for Siobhan. I was wondering if you could share with us a little bit about um, the types of private landowners you work with and the different sizes and the range of objectives that you Sure. Okay, so Cheryl's question was about the different landowners that I work with, sizes, different objectives. It's kind of why I do my job. I love the diversity in and across the landscape. So um, I have a background in my original background in consulting and working with small landowners. And then my early middle early career was with industrial forest land, um, corporate ownership, forestry. So I have this kind of background. Yes. <laughs> um, this background that's pr that's pretty broad. And and so I I, I still am able to kind of speak from both those perspectives and serve both those kinds of landowners. So me personally, I still uh, I still work some and contract back to industry that's um, that's on a smaller scale or it's a portion of my work. But at the heart of the work that I'm doing with um, with equip and really where the the meat of it all lies in the fun is that I'm working with people who are, usually 10 acres to, you know, this, this is on the larger end, Yacon is on the larger end of being 400 plus acres. I've worked in the past with like up to a thousand acre properties doing forest management plans. So yeah, I like, and every piece of property is unique and every landowner has a different reason or different flavor reasons for owning their property. So that's really the joy for me of this process is that with everyone, it's a little bit different and I get that diversity and it's an incredibly creative process because there's all this, the, the land itself is different, the people are different, and then the collaboration is different every time. So it's, it's pretty diverse, but um, I work with a lot of different folks and, and it's, I get to do, I get to just follow my nose, which mm -hmm. is awesome. So, yeah. Another question. If no oh. One. oh, go ahead. This question is for me. So, do you guys use LIDAR to assess tree health at all? So, the question is do we, do I use LIDAR to assess tree health? Personally, I don't do that. I don't do LIDAR work personally. I can work with existing data sets, right? So, I'm able to create maps based on someone has already done the light flight. So that's publicly available through the Oregon Dogami, it's Department of Geologic something resources, right? So I'm able to utilize the data sets, but I don't uh, I don't create the data sets. Whereas if there are uh, there are like different businesses that will create those data sets for you. Uh, there's more happening in the drone world with being able to fly small pro properties. You know, it used to be you had to pay for this airplane to fly a thousand acres to get your LIDAR. Now you can now you can get those data sets on a smaller scale. Uh, but I don't I don't deal in and figuring out the uh, that those data sets at all. Uh, I like to use them. I love LIDAR. I love the hill shades and I love the canopy height models that you can get. Um, you there's you know there's 
a growing ability to be able to sense from above the, you know, their carbon stocks and the tree health and the various species. And people are trying to even bring it down to, you know, diameter classes. Mm -hmm. um, but personally, I don't, I don't actually do that. No. I'm very interested in it, of course. <laughs> yeah. Definitely. Yeah. Uh, so heavy question, but uh, what are the biggest challenges for you in like thinking about climate change and how species assemblages are are changing with with climate change and and how you work that into your your forest management plans that you develop? Yeah, sure. Uh, the question is about how I'm integrating the the challenge of climate change into into the work that I'm doing. It's been a process, right? Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm like coming into a, a, like a settled area. Of, uh, you know, I've done a lot of thinking, you know, personally, what impact can I have? What, what, what work on the ground impact that I'm having? Of course, understanding that we're, you know, we're part of a much bigger picture, right? Each little thing that we do on the ground is part of something bigger. Um, so trying not to consider the activities that I'm prescribing in isolation and then the, the part where I'm settling is in comfort with the fact that we're working in a novel ecosystem, right? And you can't put the toothpaste back in the tube. I want to honor the past and and the and the assemblages of vegetation that were present on the landscape historically and the ways that the land was used. And I work in the valley, so I you know do a lot of the oak restoration type activities. And I I do that with the knowledge that one, the climate is different than it was, and the situation of uh, uh, land use is different than it was, right? So we can't go back to the past, and that it's changing in the future. So it's always kind of thinking, well, you know, the, the life of a tree is quite long, right? So is what I'm putting here best adapted today first? And it, it does it have the resilience to 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 withstand what's coming or what might be coming. Um, so like at Yakona, uh, the conversation man was, you know, about that, that we have species that are well adapted to, to be there now, but we're thinking hotter, drier, right? Um, so some of the species that are being grown in the greenhouse, uh, there's a specific example of the redwood um, that you planted out there. Uh, there's there's a thousand planted redwoods. So, uh, and then some of the shrub species being grown in the greenhouses are a little bit more of those, you think drier Southern Oregon type um, site. So trying, like, I see them as like little experiments. You would never go plant, like I would never want to go plant a whole, like let's just put them all into the redwoods because that's what's coming. No, I, I love the idea of just trying, like just see how it grows. I mean, the ones that are on the neighbors on that property on the peninsula are amazing, you know? So there, we know there's potential for redwood. There's already Orford cedar out there. It has a disease issue, but there's resistant varieties available now. So thinking about, okay, you know, what, what might look a little more hotter and drier and, and what can we get in the future? So it's a lot of like being okay with the fact that I'm dealing with a novel ecosystem. Cause I like, I struggle with that. Like, oh, you know, what am I doing? <laughs> um, but, but I can't do except the best that I can with the science we have and in, and the, you know, best laid adaptive plans. Right. And just being ready to pivot. Right. Cause whoo, what's going to happen. You're going to get like a fire or some kind of disturbance. That's the, always in the way of nature. So, yeah. Thank you. Sort of part B to that question. Uh, I'm interested in carbon storage that you guys are talking about. And has that been calculated like tons per acre? And the carbon credits, are you we uh are we capitalizing on that? Is it worth capitalizing on? Can you go in on that? Yeah, so the question is regarding forest carbon. Uh, how is it calculated and, and is it available and are we capitalizing on that? And the, uh, the answer is yes. Yukona is under a lease agreement with an organization called Forest Carbon Works as part of the plan. I mean, we're, we're so well situated to just like do everything at once, right? I mean, it was beautiful. 
there's we're planning for the forest, setting up an organization, you know, hiring staff, executive director, like everything is going. And it's like, well, while we're going, how about we consider carbon? And how about we consider the conservation easement? So those are two other things we haven't, I don't think, talked about at all today, which also were put in place this year, the uh, the Forest Carbon Works Carbon Agreement and the um, McKinsey River Trust Conservation Easement are both in place at Yakona. Um, so to go back to the question that is specific about carbon, Forest Carbon Works is one of well, the market, if you know much about it, it's a, it's a kind of, yeah. you know, <laughs> there's a lot of conversations, so to speak, about the, you know, sale of carbon. Uh, from my perspective, I want to see good conservation, right? That's why I want to connect my landowners with Equip. That's why I would love to see them compensated for the good work they're doing regarding carbon, because, um, to your question about is it calculated, there are uh, growing data sets. So I don't know that many of them are very publicly available, but I think there are some, but um, if someone if someone in the chat also knows about getting publicly available ones, but there's like, I saw recently there's a new heat map, you know, where you can look at like, oh, the, this area can store this much carbon. So typically what's being done is, you're comparing it to kind of to your neighbors. What's the carbon potential? And so what's the lift you're getting by doing this old growth management, uh, this sort of late successional lot, like we want to increase the carbon on site versus my neighbors, the average neighbor in Oregon, which is more of this industrial short-term rotation. So what's the, and again, this is just carbon stored underground because there's a, a different, aspect of carbon stored in products that you're getting from those other forest lands. But the attributes of Yukona are, are great for on-site carbon storage. And so um, the Forest Carbon Works calculated that for us and found, you know, they, they determined what the lift, so to speak, is. What's the difference between neighboring? And then they're compensating for that. Um, Small scale isn't really going great, not gangbusters. Uh, there's been a lot of people trying to bring that model down to like small landowners. It's still, the payments are still like barely to cover your taxes kind of thing. You you still do better at scale. Um, and here in Oregon, it's forest carbon works. It's finite carbon is trying to come up with a small landowner program. There's a couple programs available in the East but there's not, it's not a lot and it's not what we hoped. Um, and it's not ramped up like you would have, liked. but um, yeah, does that answer your question? Yeah. Yeah, Joanne. Well, at Shabon, when we first started 11 years ago, there was not a, a company that would even look at anything less than a thousand acres. Right. They're just like, yeah. we'd go to the conferences and they go, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. So Joanne is saying that uh, 10 years ago, 11 years ago, that she couldn't find anybody who was doing small scale. So there's certainly been progress. The fact that there was a program that can handle that uh, smaller scale. And and I believe they advertised down to 40 acres. I don't know financially how that would be terribly rewarding to you, but um, but you can certainly explore it and try. Uh, I know that they're working here in Oregon and having conversations with landowners. Um, there's been some kind of fleeting activity that's come and gone, um, but those programs, are, they're, they're not nascent anymore. They're, they're actually going, but they're still having trouble getting traction because you know, that problem, it's expensive to monitor. How are we monitoring? And then there's the argument about, is it additional? And, and that, that's when you start rolling into those other challenges. Thank you. Yeah. This question is for Natalie. Um, from the landowner perspective, can you share with us what was the most challenging in the process and then what was the most rewarding? Well, the question is, what was the most challenging and what was the most rewarding in uh, land management practices? 
Yeah, or when going through the, the NRCS process. Oh, going through this. Okay. Well, that's easy. I can answer that one. <laughs> because I have only been around for two and a half years. So, um, well, I would say that the most rewarding has been working with Annie and Siobhan because they have held our hand the whole way. And um, it's very governmental. <laughs> you know, I've, I've done a lot of state grants, but I have uh, shied away from the federal stuff and there's a good reason for that. So <laughs> Annie did all the heavy lifting. And so that's by far, I think, the greatest part of working with them. Um, you know, I I would say that the challenge really has been, and, you know, this is only because we're doing it now, is that we're finding that uh, some of the practices that our experts have suggested would work have not. Mm -hmm. And so we've just tried other things. We've tried all kinds of things. And what we're finding is that, um, I think I shared it earlier, stakes don't work in the slough, uh, probably because of the high soil or water salinity content from the king tides. Just does not work. They, we've tried two years in a row, hundreds of stakes, poor docents have not gotten, I mean, they would leave out and then they would shrivel and die. So no stakes, we're not doing that anymore. But the floods work. So we're we're starting them in the nursery and then planting them out kind of up against the hillside. Surprisingly enough, it's wet all year there. Even without the tides coming in, it's wet. It's wet. It was wet in the middle of summer. It's wet now, even though, of course, we've had a little bit of rain. But up against that hillside has been great. And so they're living. Um, Willow's doing a lot better than the trees. The red alder, surprisingly, isn't doing that well. Um, I kind of thought it would. The crab apple, it's a little bit more than 50%, but it's not great. Um, I, it could be, and I was just talking to Annie about this tonight, that some of the trees we got were kind of later in the season, and maybe they just got put in later in the season. So, you know, we're going to keep trying. It's not like we're giving up on that. We're, we're actually had planted in the marsh too, where um, our dear friend Evan had suggested it might be a little too dark in there, but we're trying it anyway, because um, it just seems like, well, first of all, it's fresh water. Mm -hmm. So it's much more likely to survive. It just doesn't have the sun exposure that the slough does. Slough is perfect for riparian vegetation on that sort of south facing slope or not really a slope, but you know, the flat there. So yeah, it's, it's been, you know, I um, got my master's in habitat restoration in the nineties. So it's been a long time since I've done this kind of work. And I just am remembering how wonderful and rewarding it is to do it. Because, you know, when you can see a bud growing on a plant or something you thought was dead and then no, it's not alive, it's just alive. Oh, yes, it's so exciting. <laughs> so thank you for the question. Yeah, go ahead. For you, Natalie. Okay. Um, education, you know, you in your presentation, you showed that that's part of the values. Of the, uh, is that that's outside of this? So the work here was is for on the ground management things and things like you're talking about things leaving out. I wonder as well the next generation of little humans coming up, them leaving out. Uh, so just curious a little bit the education part of the compass. So the question is how we may be integrating the habitat management and enhancement with education. And um, I would say that it's all integrated. We have our students, you saw pictures of the students doing the monitoring protocols. That's all part of the habitat stuff. But we also have them engaged in growing the plants in the nursery that we have now and in outplanting. 
and then in monitoring. So it's a cycle that will go on and on a lifetimes of habitat restoration out there. They're also, I taught an environmental studies at Yukana Nature Preserve course for high school students this last semester. We'll do it again this year for local school district high school students. And, uh, you know, they got to build habitat piles. They did their own research. They um, did all the monitoring that we do. They loved it. Uh, one of them has enrolled in the Southwestern Community College in the Forestry Department. Um, one of them was going to OSU and oceanography. That didn't change for him. <laughs> but um, the other one was, he, he's really interested in biomedical engineering, and he probably totally be the next major CEO. Give him 20 years, and that guy's... <laughs> but, um, you know, for someone who... He, he grew up on a plant nursery locally, and for him to see it in action and you know not just for production and retail but to actually make things happen on the ground i think it was really rewarding for him as well so you know that that's that is definitely um, the way that we model our education program is to integrate what we're doing out there ourselves for students so that they get a sense of what it's like to work in nature the way we do.